evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening lecture in the Festival of Ideas. It's great to have you with us. My name is Karen Bloor. I'm a professor of health economics and policy in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of York, and I'm chairing this evening's lecture. So it's um, a, a real pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker. Nina Power is a writer and philosopher. She's written regularly for The Telegraph, The Art Review and The Spectator, amongst many other publications. She's the author of One Dimensional Woman, which the New Statesman called A Joy to Read. And we're delighted to welcome Nina tonight to talk about her latest book. Here it is, and highly recommended. Um, what do men want? Masculinity and its discontents. Great title. Um, in which she addresses men's issues such as engagement with the manosphere to the Me Too backlash from men's rights activists and incels to spiraling suicide rates. So please allow me to welcome Nina to share with us the secrets hidden in our culture to enable men and women to practice playfulness and forgiveness and to reach a, a true mutual understanding. So no pressure, Nina, <laughs> but let welcome this evening. Um, thanks, Karen, and thanks to everyone at the York um, Festival for the invitation and to, um, to be here and happy solstice. Uh, it's a beautiful <laughs> evening here and we have this sort of celestial light shining into my messy office. Um, so I'm going to sort of speak about the book and some of the themes for about maybe 30 minutes or a bit longer, um, but not too much longer. Um, and yeah, so maybe just a word about the um, title to begin with. Of course, asking this question of what do men want is a, is a fool's errand. Um, it's also a kind of joke uh, in relation to Freud's very infamous question, uh, what does woman want, uh, which he says he is unable to answer. Um, and I thought it might be sort of cheeky and funny to try to, to pose the um, opposing question. And, and also there's a double Freud reference in the subtitle, um, not civilization and its discontents, but masculinity and its discontents. Um, and I suppose in that regard, one of my main motivations for writing this book, and of course it's a book about men written by a woman, and, and some people have said, well, wouldn't it be annoying if men wrote books about, um, about what women want? And I, I think actually, no, I think it'd be great. I think it would be the, the, the more the merrier. Um, but one of the things I wanted to address was, I suppose, something that I saw happening in the, in the culture, in the media, um, particularly maybe over the last five, 10 years, um, which seemed to be a kind of quite divisive rhetoric, um, which was positioning men as um, somehow kind of fundamentally opposed or the enemy of women. Um, it was almost like the kind of um, stereotypical um, and in fact unfair image of the radical feminists from the 70s had been kind of reincarnated into contemporary liberal feminism, which I don't actually think is particularly feminist. Um, and so you had this kind of almost permission given uh, for a sort of hatred or an outpouring of hatred um, towards men as a class or a category of, of human beings. And I think from any political position, um, this is a uh, this is a bad move. <laughs> uh, I think it's bad if you're on the left because it de-emphasizes forms of solidarity um, and uh, forms of uh, collective bargaining and behavior that are necessary for any form of um, useful left-wing politics. And even if you look at very early first wave feminists, for example, Alexandra Kollontai in the Soviet Union, she's talking about the differences between men and women uh, in some ways, but fundamentally she's talking about the solidarity of working class men and women. So I think this uh, divisive rhetoric of so you know toxic masculinity, the idea that all men are somehow inherently bad or that they're all responsible for all of the things that men have done um, was, uh, you know, is, is kind of causing rifts in our society. And it's not the only kind of rift, but I want to focus on this one, um, not least because my previous work had focused a lot more on feminism and the history of feminism. Um, and I thought it would be interesting uh, to, to look at men. So I, I tried not to shy away from some of the more difficult questions, um, which are to do uh, in, amongst other things to do with male violence, not only violence against women, but also violence against men, 
um, and also again men against themselves so you know it's clear that men a small number of men are um, responsible for almost all interpersonal violence and I think everybody is keen to think about what what are the reasons for that and also how we can avoid that and I guess one of my main arguments is that describing all men as um, toxic or, 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 or um, condemning all forms of masculinity in a negative way, I think actually contributes to uh, a, a negative feeling, um, which is unlikely then to inspire men to behave well. So I think it's counterproductive, this kind of supposedly progressive rhetoric um, that is very negative towards men. And instead, what I suggest in the book is that we need to think much more in terms of virtue, um, not just for men, but also for women. So the question is a very old question, you know, what does it mean to be a good man or, or a good woman? So in that sense, it's kind of very traditionalist um, in a certain way. Um, but I think I'm also trying to situate that question in a contemporary way you know we're all we all live in a mixed world so one of my starting points is the fact that we live in a heterosocial universe by which I mean men and women are mixed socially all the time right we you know part of modernity has been the the erosion or the elimination of separate spheres for men and women right so men and women encounter each other all the time in the workplace uh, play uh, in the pub, um, at school and, you know, in shops, whatever, just, you know, we don't live in a kind of sex segregated world for better or worse. So uh, in a pragmatic sense, we need to think about ways of um, living together, I think, that don't involve forms of paranoia and suspicion and, um, and division, because I think we're all fundamentally sort of thrown into the world. Um, we don't, you know, neither men nor women hold the secret to, you know, why we're here. But I think it's a collective project of understanding. Um, and I think part of that involves kind of dialogue. It also involves a kind of um, willingness to accept um, that people do harm, that both men and women are capable of upsetting each other, um, but that we need to be kind of more forgiving in general. And I think the media, and, and other aspects of society has created a very unforgiving culture as if we can't understand one another or as if everyone is acting from sort of malevolent or malicious mo motives when largely we're not largely people are making mistakes if and when they do um you know cause harm and and i think part of this is to do with this kind of mind body split that the internet has kind of created and and these kind of divisions not just around sex but around all kinds of contentious topics so lots of people have ended up um feeling fundamentally opposed to one another because they've fallen out over issues like brexit or you know sex and gender or whatever you know there's there's lots and lots of things like that um so i think there's there's a broader context which is this kind of turn away from dialogue which I'm very keen to oppose <laughs> in the name perhaps of clinging on to not only a philosophical idea of discussion the fact that we all have reasons for our positions even where we disagree um, but that I think fundamentally politics is about coming to um, perhaps a position that recognizes differences of opinion and doesn't exactly make everybody happy but tries to make everybody uh, less unhappy <laughs> uh, if you see what I mean and and this involves quite complicated and difficult um, discussions about what it is that different groups of people might want and fundamental to that I think is recognizing the difference of men and women so I'm very clear to say that men the opening line is men and women exist um, which I think shouldn't be a controversial statement but um, in some sense might be so uh, but I am keen to uh, to recognize sexual difference and to say that it's important in particular contexts. Um, and, and I think that a politics that tries to refuse sexual difference um, is going to end up, um, I, I think, in confusion uh, in many ways. And, and I, I think there's a deeper question, which I'm not sure I or anyone else could answer, about why sexual difference has become so contentious, you know, why defining what a man or what a woman is has become one of the the most controversial issues of our age you know and I think many women in particular have been severely punished for for even raising this in a political 
um, context, you know, including in the Labour Party, um, which is where I kind of first came across this issue uh, in its con controversy. And I hadn't really understood why before that, why it had been so um, contentious. So, I mean, in that sense, I think the book is um, controversial, although I don't I don't think it is. I think it's kind of reasonable and I maybe being reasonable is slightly contentious today. I think if one of the things I thought when I was writing it actually was if I'd written a polemic kind of against men, that in a way it might have been an easier sell <laughs> somehow, you know, like it would have um, accorded or fitted in with this culture, which seemed to be put, moving towards this divisiveness. And one of my reasons, my main motivations for not doing that actually was that it's simply not true in relation to my own life, right? Like I'm now in my 40s, my experience of men is overwhelmingly positive. And this includes my relationship with my, my father, my brother, you know, male partners, um, both current and previous, you know, male friends and so on. And, you know, a large part of me really didn't like the way that men were being kind of um, blanket smeared as, as a fundamentally negative force when this is not true. And I think it's not true for the vast majority of women, you know, even where there's a kind of negative encounter or a bad relationship or something like that, like it's unfair both for men to do that to women and for women to do that to men, you know, to then generalize from, from one negative experience. So I wanted to capture something of that ambivalence and ambiguity and complexity of social romantic life, you know, not only romantic, but also our general, um, our general life and not kind of um, go for this, reductive um, polemic, which I think is also where people are sort of somehow being rhetorically pushed um, and even rewarded for that kind of um, rhetoric. So it's part of an ongoing uh, discussion, I think within feminism, I would say, but also within a kind of liberal culture more broadly that seeks to uh, divide human beings along um, categorical lines. Um, which again, I think politically is very um, dubious um, and I think is kind of um, dangerous and untrue and actually serves a kind of more elite agenda and it doesn't help um, um, everyday uh, people at all. So I wanted to oppose what I describe in the book as a, a kind of zero sum game image of culture, which is to say um, the zero sum idea is that if one group uh, advances then another group must lose so some of the rhetoric we're confronted with today is the idea that on the one hand if women somehow do better then men are losing or vice versa historically that if men were doing better then somehow women were losing and I think even when we're talking about things like patriarchy like whether we you know I'm very critical of this concept in the book or at least critical of the way in which it's used uh, very casually and superficially um, in a lot of rhetoric today. And even when you go back and look at the serious work that was done in the second wave, you know, and I regard myself in many ways as a second wave feminist or part of that um, tradition, that, um, you know, the books on patriarchy, like Gerda Lerner's excellent book, she says explicitly, this is not about women being victims. You know, patriarchy is not about um, women being oppressed by men, you know, which is very different from how people use this term today. You know, what the second wave, I think we're trying to, to say was also that women have strength. Women are not fundamentally victims. And often these kind of social formations benefit women too. You know, and I, I'm not suggesting therefore that all historical formations um, were equally beneficial for women. But I think it doesn't make sense to talk about um, today without understanding what we might call a sort of sim certain sympathy or symbiosis or cooperation. You know, none of us would be here um, without uh, the fact that men and women get along, which is indeed my, my second line in the book. You know, uh, sometimes we even get along, um, you know, we exist and sometimes we, we actually like each other and, and this is sort of somehow uh, important to restate, even though in some ways it seems absolutely kind of basic. Um, but I think when a culture is has become quite antagonistic, it might be important just to restate very basic um, truths somehow. So I'm interested also in the book in the forms of wisdom that 
um, pertain to kind of traditional um, cultures. So I look back in some ways at some of the Greek ideas of what it means to be strong um, and to be virile even. And these are things that we tend to associate with um, action on the one hand, or even sex, purely sexual, um, you know, sort of profligacy on the other. But for the, for the Greeks, the ancient Greeks, the idea of male strength is not using strength but rather judging or being able to know when to deploy strength. So strength is not simply the, the practice of being strong, for example. And I think it's these kind of subtle um, differences that we need to recall, um, I think, rather than simply saying, no, all masculinity is bad because it's violent, because it's domineering, because it's oppressive towards women. This isn't the case, right? We, we have to say that some masculinities are good and some masculinities are better than others not least because if you tell boys and men that they're sort of fundamentally wrong, you're gonna create, and we already see this, I think, um, generations of young men who, who are taught to feel guilty for something that they can't help, i.e. being born male. You know, And I think we have to get away from this kind of idea of, um, I don't know, revenge or retribution. You know, I think it's, it's manifestly obvious that, um, if you have this zero sum game idea in which, you know, eye for an eye, it, you just end up in a spiral of violence, which is kind of never ending. Um, and I wanted to say that perhaps after the Me Too movement um, and these kind of, let's say, historical, um, I don't know, events, that maybe there is a time for kind of reconciliation that follows these sorts of uh, things. And I think in the sense of thinking about the sexual revolution. And I, you know, there are many people at the moment, I think Louise Perry would be one, Mary Harrington and others, who are thinking about what it means to be 60 years after the, the sexual revolution. And perhaps it's time to take stock of what was, let's say, gained and what was perhaps lost and what we might want to keep and what we might find um, that's actually kind of socially destructive as a consequence of the revolution. And I, I think, this is again a broader question about how we understand history and progress. And, you know, I, I think progress is not simply blindly following every technological innovation and thinking that there's no way out of this and we just have to kind of go along with um, whatever happens. I think it's actually uh, pausing and taking stock of uh, where we're at and saying, you know, some of these things serve us and some of them have made us their servants, if you see what I mean, right? So I'm quite critical of various technologies, including um, dating apps. Um, I think there are kind of um, downsides to um, some of the, uh, I suppose this image of freedom that is kind of uh, promoted or presented from the 60s onwards as if uh, sexual liberation is somehow tied up with who you are or becoming who you are you know and, and perhaps it's it's not quite like that so I, I'm I'm more broadly skeptical of certain liberal individualist I conceptions of freedom and I stress instead the uh, I guess a relational model of what it is to to exist you know and, and what it means to have a social role and I think this ties in very um, carefully and precisely to to the question of male suicide in particular and while suicide is very um, complicated and difficult to talk about, and you know, I I've personally had three male friends who've committed suicide, and I probably everybody knows uh, men in particular who have. And again, I'm not suggesting, by the way, that women don't suffer or that women don't attempt or commit suicide, but rather we know that male suicide is a serious problem. It's it's like the leading leading cause of death of men under 45 um, in the UK. Um, is to try to identify some of the broader cultural reasons and social reasons why this is happening, why some men are feeling so alienated and so dejected by the cosmos and their social environment and the world. Um, and I, I talk about this in relation to social roles um, and what it means to for those to have been eroded, particularly uh, for men. So I take seriously at least um, at face value, some of the complaints of so-called men's rights activists who are generally hated <laughs> as a group and, and sort of laughed at and dismissed um, because the idea is that I suppose men have the power. Why would why on earth would they suggest otherwise? Um, 
But we know that this sort of isn't true, uh, especially when we factor in questions of class. Um, it's very obvious, for example, not any uh, kind of workplace deaths or the opioid crisis, so unemployed men. And if you look at the deindustrialization of Western countries, including uh, Britain, um, we can see this kind of erosion of uh, social roles for men and this uh, increasing feeling, I think, of, of uselessness, um, of not having a place, of not having a function, of not being in a position to provide or protect. Um, and I think since I've uh, finished the book, I've become increasingly interested in these questions of, um, on the one hand, like questions of care, and whether there are different models of care that men and women ex exhibit. I talk in the book about what one man, uh, Matt Chrisman, describes as uh, the male abstract rage to protect, which I thought was a very beautiful description, the abstract rage to protect, um, and whether this is a particular, uh, particularly male um, feeling. Um, in relation to uh, perhaps more female uh, models of, of care, and of course this gets complicated because one of the things that we're always being told not to do is, is, is to be essentialist, you know, to be an essentialist is like the biggest crime uh, today or amongst the biggest crimes, <laughs> apart from talking about men and women. Um, but it's, you know, so, but I do think we can talk about uh, some differences. I think it would be foolish not to. And it doesn't mean that every man and every woman has to behave in particular ways. Indeed, uh, to, to again reference the second wave, part of the, the point of the second wave was to get rid of those narrow gendered expectations um, and to say, and to, to actually celebrate different forms of expression in boys and girls and men and women to, and to say, you know, we are, we do have a sex but it doesn't tell us anything about how we existentially live out our sex, if you see what I mean, you know, and I think that was one of the great innovations. And I think at some point, I don't know when, maybe in the 2000s, uh, we slid backwards into a kind of very stereotypical set of um, uh, ideas about gender, uh, as if, you know, if you're a girl and you enjoy things that are typically associated with a boy, then somehow you must be male. I mean, this is absolutely regressive. Um, you know, and this is not the, the the way things were heading. You know, I grew up in the, the 90s. I was a teenager in the 90s. And uh, in, now it looks, uh, in, in retrospect, it looks like a, a kind of paradise for this kind of thing because nobody ever said anything about um, gender roles. It was like, you know, you could be as masculine, like you could be a tomboy, you could be like a ladette, you know, whatever. It didn't, it, no one ever said for a second that that meant that you were somehow... Uh, a man it was it, there was a kind of expansion of um of um possible uh i don't know behaviors and feelings and interests um and i wonder if there's a kind of bigger question about what's happened to character and personality you know like we're all masculine and feminine in different ways and i think i i do talk about freud in the book and freud has this idea of a kind of constitutive bisexuality you have a similar idea in jung with uh, anima and animus you know, that, that everybody, every human being has kind of um, different um, um, aspects and we could call it passive and, and active or masculine or feminine or whatever, but that we all have um, tendencies. No one is a pure 100% cliche of male or female, you know, and, and this is good <laughs> that we're all sort of in that sense, a mixture of things. And this, this comprises um, our character and our personality. Um, and, you know, something sort of strange to my mind has kind of happened where, where certain behaviours have become very rigid and, and fetishised, um, you know, whereas before, like even quite rec in recent memory, they weren't. Um, and so I, I, it might be interesting um, to talk about that um, with, the, with the audience or whether, you know, whether I'm, I'm just wrong about this or whether, I, whether I'm regressive or reactionary and maybe there's some great new revolutionary force going on but I I sort of don't I don't think so uh, personally um, so I suppose you know just to just kind of round round up some of what I wanted to say is I wanted to take like male suffering seriously so I do look at not only kind of male suicide rates and some of the complaints of men's rights activists but I also look at other demonized groups like incels so involuntary celibates who've become a kind of big um I don't know, again, a media object um, in relation to various kind of shootings which have been pinned at the, 
the the door of of of, of so-called incels so so men who are involuntarily celibate which is to say men who don't um, have a girlfriend or or don't uh, you know who are somehow unattractive to women and I try to address that question of the let's say the unfairness of desire um, head on it is a big uh, question it's a big uh, problem uh, for populations um, I look in particular at a group called MGTOW men going their own way um, who are kind of a very small group but they're very interesting and very symptomatic I think and these are men who've de decided if you like not to preemptively not participate in the heterosexual uh, world um, because they think the whole thing is a kind of um, a scam I guess and they point out that something like historically 60% of men um, haven't reproduced you know they haven't had children and this is also partly to do with things like war um, but also you know that, that there's something kind of fundamentally uh, asymmetrical about uh, male and female um, sexual uh, or reproductive um, profiles um, and I think this is uh, again something worth talking about rather than sort of pretending it's not real or, or demonizing um, those men who after all um, simply would like to be loved which is an extremely human uh, desire you know and I and again I think we're all much um, closer um, than we might think we are in terms of what it is that we want and what it is that we we think um, you know so while, while there are differences and I again I think sexual difference is important in particular um, areas um, we are also uh, very much characterized by um, our similarities in in what it is um, that we want and whilst I of course I don't directly answer the question of what do men want although I do provide a list I, I asked all of my male friends and they gave me a whole series of, of of things so it was like a shed or a beer or pussy or to be left alone and so on so I, I actually do answer the question uh, but I think it's it's basically recognizing uh, perhaps that desire is intimately tied not only to suffering, which again, I think is often forgotten um, in an era of like consumerism and the idea that, you know, you can solve any problem, but you can't. Um, and not all desires are equally good, uh, which again, I think is a kind of fallacy of a consumerist logic. You know, the idea that if I want something, it must be good because desire is good. You know, again, this is partly from the sexual revolution, but, um, but, you know, it's manifestly obvious that not all desires are, <laughs> are good or, or equal. Um, and then this relates back to this kind of moral question, really, of what it means to be good. And in a way, all I really say on this point is that we can all be better. Um, and I think part of that being better is not only recognising the existence of the other um, and understanding that people are different from you and have different desires, um, but also accepting that a kind of humility um, and the capacity to forgive um, belongs to everybody. Um, we're all capable of harm. We've all made mistakes. Again, I think we live in a very, very unforgiving culture. And I think sometimes this has played out sort of extremely cruelly, um, particularly men against men in recent years. Um, and I think there is a sense in which um, if we are to have a mature discussion about what it is to actually live in this heterosocial world and to actually you know, get on and and in a way, I suppose, both recognize suffering, but also try to ameliorate it, you know, to 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 stop um, uh, men from hurting themselves from hurting each other and and from hurting women, but also for women to maybe understand a bit more um, where men are coming from, um, you know, then we need to be a little bit um, a less brittle somehow and a bit more open to kind of dialogue um and comprehension so yeah i mean those are some of the the main ideas in the in the book but um i'm happy to talk about anything that's come up from what i've said or you know related matters that's fantastic thanks thanks so much nina um fascinating um, set of issues that we can discuss. Now we've got lots of questions already, um, so we'll we'll make a start on those. But if I can just encourage everybody to to join in the debate and um, do put do put your questions in in the Q and A box. Um, 
I'm going to not go from the top because I, I never do really. Um, I'll come back to some of the earlier ones, but there's one in the middle um, from James, and he says that you raise many excellent points about the original state of contemporary discourse, like the zero sum game. And how do you think we ended up here? How did we end up in this very strange situation? Yeah, I mean, I think I think an obvious partial answer would be to do with the kind of tools and technologies that have kind of come to dominate um, our everyday lives, including working life, um, which serve, I think, primarily to, to distantiate even um, where we are similar, even where we're kind of talking about um, similar kinds of things, you know, it's because you're not face to face with people, because you're not in their proximity, because it's not to do with local ties and all of those sorts of things, it's much easier to imagine that people are your enemies or implacably opposed to you um, when actually they're, they're probably not, or at least uh, a face to face conversation um, would maybe make it harder for both sides to simply dismiss the other person. So I think we, you know, we become alienated from one another. Um, a more kind of conspiratorial answer, I suppose, would be that to ask, well, who does it serve if, um, you know, we are divided from one another and maybe fighting battles uh, or being distracted from uh, bigger material uh, realities. Um, I suppose, and and some people have suggested that the the internet is very useful for the elites because it means that like we're not looking at oligarchs and billionaires, but rather fighting amongst ourselves. Um, you know how we can sort of empirically uh, prove this, but you know we look at we we could look at the kind of um, material consequences of of these uh, these tools. Um, I think you know there are deep human tendencies to want to divide and differentiate and I think we're all desirous beings we're all you know capable of strong feeling we've all been hurt we've all hurt you know it's those sorts of deep feelings perhaps uh you know often they're in the unconscious but they're quite easy to control or they can be controlled let's say mm -hmm. by by rhetoric and you know if you start to say well, everyone in this particular group is uh, bad or, you know, somehow characterized negatively, then you can start hating that group, right? Like this is, we've seen this happen over and over again, like this is human history in many ways. Um, and I think at the moment, you've, we've got this idea that because if you say, well, you're allowed to hate this group, <laughs> because uh, either they hate and therefore you're allowed to hate people who hate. So you could say, well, men hate women or men have treated women badly, therefore you're allowed to hate them. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't solve the problem, actually. What it does is you end up in a kind of a spiral of, of resentment and revenge, um, which just uh, proliferates basically. And I, I'm very informed by certain thinkers uh, amongst whom would be Rene Girard, who's a great theological thinker of, of scapegoating and sacrifice and um, what he calls uh, mimetic rivalry, um, which is the idea that we're, as human beings, we, we seek to emulate each other. We're actually much closer than we might think. We're not really individuals <laughs> in the way that liberal liberalism tries to tell us we are or consumerism does. Um, but rather we are um, perpetually concerned with um, who we are in a social setting um, and that we, we want what other people want. So desire is fundamentally mimetic, which is to say we copy other people. So if you have a system that is manipulating people's desire in particular ways, then you can get people to kind of become resentful towards a particular group and so on. And I, and I just think these forms of... Um, manipulation, whoever it's aimed against, um, will lead to, to further violence, actually, ultimately. And I think the, the, the difficult question is how you pull back from um, uh, resentment and hatred, particularly when, as always, there's a kernel of truth to it, right? So it's, it is easy to look back at human history and say, look, men are responsible for the vast majority of interpersonal violence. Yeah. What do we do with that? fact you know how do we um 
not only recognize it, but um, aim to collectively um, reduce it um, and prevent it in future. And, and as I say, my, my suggestion is that we don't further demonize men, um, but rather, you know, we, we suggest better ways of being. And this also goes for women too. You know, if there's toxic masculinity, there's also toxic femininity and women have negative social strategies too. Um, and I think we have to say that, not least because women are also rational, moral adults, you know, and if we say that women can't be, uh, can't behave badly, then we're basically saying again that they're like children or animals. And this is something we desperately want to avoid. And I think any feminism worth its salt does not primarily or fundamentally position women as victims first and foremost. Hmm. Um, yeah. Thanks, Nina. That's a fascinating, fascinating answer. Just, just to um, come back to the issue of male violence, just because there's a, a question directly about that one. Um, Steve says to end male violence, which is one of the biggest social health issues in our society, we surely need to understand its causes. And what do you think are the root causes of male violence? Um, and he also asked what what would be the most effective steps to reduce or end it? I think you've answered some of that, but I wondered mm -hmm. if you wanted to expand on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a variety, there's been a variety of suggestions, whether it's to do with kind of, I don't know, excess testosterone or, um, you know, comparisons. I've just been reading lots of kind of um, books. Uh, well, uh, Franz Duval has a new book about uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and <laughs> where human beings are situated in this kind of primatology, kind of evolutionary biology picture. And, and we're sort of midway between chimpanzees and, and bonobos, but he, you know, uh, Franz Duval at least says that we've misunderstood something like the, you know, the idea of the alpha and chimpanzee community. And some people have tried to sort of simply apply it to human society, mm -hmm. um, you know, inappropriately. Um, I, I think it's, it's one of the reasons why I think stressing sexual difference is important is because we need to recognize um, precisely that men, uh, you know, in general are bigger and stronger than women you know it, it's it's uh it's they are different we are sexually dimorphic species you know the vast majority of women cannot <laughs> like physically take on any man you know even if he's unfit right like so i think this is important to recognize there is an asymmetry there um and i think you know a lot of the uh, work if you read some of the um books by kind of male therapists about male violence some of it is to do with mindset you know there are a small number of men who think that women are inferior and who and who think that um you know that women are somehow there to sort of serve them right and that 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 feeling does exist among a small number of men i do mm -hmm. but i don't think it's a vast majority of men so one other thing i say socially and politically that might be um, useful is for men to check other men more and i suggested this on radio 4 um i said <laughs> which i sort of shut down slightly because i i said that you know actually what would be better is 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 in some cases for men to kind of like um, keep other men in check even mm. including um, physically where men are acting out and like I think sometimes you know everybody gets upset sometimes everybody has a bad time you know everybody goes through a crisis and sometimes people you know behave um, inappropriately or badly they're acting out you know mm. and and a, and a kind of caring community or a situation which had a kind of social conscience um, you would take that person aside and you would try to work out what is going on with them you know and even in very horrible, horrible cases, like the, the police officer that used his, abused his power to kill and murder Sarah Everard, mm -hmm. you know, it, his, his male colleagues knew that this person was a wrong one, right? Like they knew yeah. he was yeah. a bad man, right? And we could have hypothetically imagined a situation in which those men who knew him knew that he was not okay and that he was a dangerous person could have in a way done far more right to protect uh women and and, and from this man right mm -hmm. so i think it's about you know and i think that women maybe have an experience often of being treated as a member of a class or as a member of a group like more often than men do i think we have a culture that definitely thinks that men are individuals first and foremost and then men secondarily so 
I think one of the more controversial things I suggest is that men should think of themselves more often as a member of a class and if they see other men behaving badly to think oh this will reflect badly on all of us and we need to look after our brother you know like that this if if a man is 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 clearly not okay um mm. to do something about it so i think there's a form of collective responsibility perhaps at the level of sex which which i i accept is not a very popular view um and that this would detract potentially from the idea that we're first and foremost individuals and that we're responsible for ourselves. Of course we are, but we're also mm. social. We're, we are also collective. Mm. We are also communal. And I think there are, there are possible interventions that men could perform with other men yeah. more easily than women could. Like it's not up to women to solve men's problems. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, and I guess we uh, there was a little bit of that with the sort of he for she thing, wasn't there? Um, but it didn't really, I'm not sure that got very much traction beyond the sort of Twitter hashtag. Um, it actually that that's one of the one of the questions um, that our audience um, have asked. Uh, this is Lydia, and she says, "Why are good men so silent on sticking up for women?" when powerful men are clearly abusive. And the example she uses is, is more about um, men in positions of authority and power. So she's talking about withholding birth control, but she says a few white men have taken disproportionate power in a very unfair way. Um, and are you denying this? Um, and she says, I resent that a few white men have taken power and use it in a way that gets me a white woman a backlash for being white. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, if men thought of themselves as part of a class, then that would include yeah. like elite men and men with power, then we mm. would ha be having a slightly different conversation, right? So I accept that some of what I'm saying would, you know, might seem superficially to be saying, oh, it's not that bad, men haven't done, you know, we should be uh, kinder and less harsh. But I but I think what I'm saying instead is, is slightly more complicated, which is to say, recognize the reality of male violence and the asymmetry of male power where it exists but to think about how we prevent that in the sense of um allowing and encouraging men to be good and mm -hmm. their boys to be good and and saying not all masculinity is bad which seems to have been the kind of liberal option in the last 10 years which i think is like you know as i say absolutely detrimental and in fact increases the problem and encourages men to think you know it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy it's like well if if i'm toxic and awful why shouldn't i just behave badly you know toxically and yeah. awful i mean it just seems very mm -hmm. basic psychology in some ways um so it's it's not that it doesn't involve this recognition of these asymmetries and 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 forms of um uh, injustice and um material um unfairness and, and exploitation and all of these things but precisely to recognize them um but to tie it back to sex and not to say oh this is to do with like individuals um because as i say i don't think individuals really exist um and 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 i suppose sort of take it from there i i um i, I don't know i don't know how else to to put it it's like You know the world the world is extremely unfair right it, mm. it it's i think if we start there right then we can talk about how we make it slightly less unfair for more yeah. people right and that's the kind of difficult question and it's not about excusing uh individual men or groups of men but precisely recognizing how that is distributed and and seeking to prevent it um primarily like first and foremost mm -hmm. But I agree. Okay, I, sorry, just on the Lydia point. Sorry, I just reread the first one of, of her question. You know, why are good men so silent? I I mm. I think that um, increasingly they're not, and I think in in reality, like maybe not on the internet. I think there is a lot going on. Like I, you know, I spoke to a lot of men about things like mentorship and about you know what happens. You know, I I gave the sort of very horrible example of like what if the colleagues of that horrific murderer had. Um, said something that's that's mm. a very obvious example of where men could have stepped up um yeah. but i do think it is it is happening more than we might think you know that I've, I've spoken to a lot of men who have actually intervened when a male friend of theirs has like gone off the rails and needs help you know it's not as widespread as it should be i agree and i i think in the sex and gender discussion i think only a few men have stepped up you know and that is a bit depressing um mm. 
but I, you know, but I think most people in general are quite self-preservationist and most people are quite conformist. And that's a kind of broader question about like human populations and how people behave when they want to protect what they have, you know, and that's a bigger question about human psychology, I think. Okay, thank you. We had a point that was also uh, related to something you, you, you touched on um, a few minutes ago, and this is from Dave, and he says that men, particularly wealthy men, kept their wives and, and sometimes daughters as slaves in all but name in years gone by. And we've had a campaign for racial financial reparations, uh, but it doesn't have any kind of equivalent campaign in, in feminism. And he was wondering why there's a difference given that labor without pay was common to women as well as black people in Western countries and their colonies. Yeah, I mean, I think this question makes sense when the overriding um, analytic tool is economic, right? And this happens in the second wave. So you have campaigns mm -hmm. like Wages for Housework, where, you know, mm -hmm. some of the feminists um, in Italy and other places say, well, why don't we just put a monetary value on the work that women do, which is unpaid, like so labour, including uh, maternal labor and housework yeah. and all of the things what what is called social reproduction everything it takes to basically reproduce an entire society um, mm -hmm. but it's largely unrecognized or attributed to a kind of fundamental um, um, some sort of extra economic uh, reality like the idea that so this is just what women do right I think the economic vision I think is not the only one, right? We're completely dominated by it. And I think it, it met within that context, like the wages for housework provocation, which it was, it was a kind of troll in a way, mm. was mm. to say in a good way, like to say, well, okay, let's think about, if you want to economize, make everything economic and materialistic in this way, then let's try and uh, quantify uh, female labor, right? Which is going to be sort of almost impossible, but it makes a good point. But I mm. think, you know, when you look at some of the, like the work I mentioned, the Gerda Lerner book on patriarchy um, from, from the second wave, you know, she talks about in a much more kind of complicated way, as does Simone de Beauvoir actually in The Second Sex, um, which is to do in the, the way in which there are other forms of power and forms of complicity and forms of kind of cooperation that historically have characterized the relationship between men and women that are extra economic. Um, and that are not always to women's disadvantage, if you see what I mean. From a certain standpoint, yes, we could look back at history and say, oh, the relationship between men and women has always been one of um, male exploitation of women, right? <laughs> this is overly simplistic. Um, and I think we have to recognise that, you know, that we're looking at it from a very particular image of what it means to be, let's say, an economically emancipated liberal individual who can sell their labour power on the market, right? And we know that this isn't necessarily actually to the advantage of either men or women, because what happens is that, you know, you have more laborers and wages are lowered. Right. So whilst we might want to fight against the family wage and say this is patriarchal and so on. Mm. Right. What we have now is, is the need or the necessity really for both if in a, let's say, heterosexual relationship with children, both parties to work in order to um, pay for. Um, what was formerly uh, a lot more affordable, if you see what I yeah. mean, right? So, so yeah. history doesn't proceed in any kind of, um, uh, I don't know, straightforward way. Like for every kind of advance, there is a, a, a kind of, um, I don't know, recuperation actually of what might have been a progressive moment. And I think feminists like Nancy Fraser or um, Hester Eisenstein are very good on these sorts of moments where a feminist demand is made and actually often what happens is it's kind of let's say for flexible labor or for you know women in the workplace it's recuperated and then kind of turned against uh women you know uh because it's not we don't live in a, a matriarchy or even in a democracy we live in a like capitalist world you know yeah, where yeah. those demands are not being treated as human demands um, but rather demands that capital can accommodate in order to exploit more. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Fascinating answer. Thank you. Um, you mentioned again a few minutes ago the, the whole concept of toxic femininity. 
and uh, Robert would like you to expand on that, what that might look like. <laughs> okay, controversial. Um, well, okay, so I mean, again, as I've said, it's important to note that women can be uh, antisocial in their own way, they can, they can be very, very um, destructive. Uh, it's important for the, for the recognition of, uh, of women as moral and rational beings that A, they can lie, um, B, that they can behave badly, and C, that they can take responsibility for these things. Otherwise, women are not adults, right? So I, want, I would say just, you know, these are personal anecdotal reflections. I, I would say toxic femininity, because women are less physically strong, um, when women want to do harm, usually to other women, it usually involves things like reputational damage, right? Mm. So it's things like gossip, bitchiness, you know, mean girl type behavior. And, and some people have suggested recently that actually the internet is extremely uh, toxically feminine <laughs> in this regard. And of course, these toxically feminine behaviors can also be performed by men, right? So mm. the internet often permits because it, you can't just like take someone outside and like, you know, you know, have a fight. And like, in the face, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, people end up sort of like reporting people to their employers because they've said something yeah. they disagree with. And, you know, this whole thing, which is just mental. Yeah. It's like, you know, the Stasi, like, cop behaviour. that You know, and, and that's not um, uh, sex-based. But we could say, look, this is these are typically... Uh, these are negative antisocial behaviors that are typically associated with women. Um, so I would say toxic femininity would involve things like, yeah, reputational damage, gossip, you know, just mean girl stuff, basically. Okay. So um, just, just to ask the rest of Robert's question, um, he said that he'd had this discussion before and came to the conclusion that if it does exist, it functions to maintain patriarchy, just like toxic masculinity. And would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I, what I'm interested in is, is, is sort of overcoming some of these artificial divisions, right, that, that are kind of being imposed rhetorically and through the media. So I think one of the things that's happening is this kind of, yeah, reputational damage was obviously being used in Me Too, for better or worse. These were these were often extra yeah. legal um, uh, attempts to basically, and, and, and in many cases, successful attempts to kind of remove men from positions of power, right? We could say some of these men had it coming, right? Like we could say like, this is a, mark, a line in the sand, this kind of behavior will no longer be tolerated at work. You know, maybe this was historically necessary. There are all kinds of ways in which we could, we could look at this moment, right? But the, thing, the kinds of things that did involve were these kind of extrajudicial, um, often guilt without sort of any um, procedure. You know, some men did commit suicide on the basis of some of the things that were said about them and so on. You know, it was kind of it's a brutal sort of vigilante way of of doing things right that the Internet mm. um, does permit. Um, and like mm. I say, that, that there's also been this kind of, uh, you know, desire amongst some people to kind of ruin people by losing them in their career and, you know, denouncing them and so on. And, and anyone who speaks out on any controversial topic is basically subject to this. And, uh, you know, yeah. inc I include myself in this, you know, it's, it's a happens kind of um, quite often. Um, I, it's an interesting question about toxic femininity, maintaining patriarchy. I think, yeah, I mean, if we, depending on how we define patriarchy, but let's say the current regime, I think the, the kind of, um, disavowed power that women have and I talk about this in the book like women have power and women do have power over men right even where they don't have physical power or even where there are asymmetries of status and money and and so on mm -hmm. right again if our image of power is merely what works in particular economic regimes this is to not understand power at all like women have all kinds of power over men um, whether we're talking about power and intimate relationships, whether we're talking about forms of kind of persuasion and manipulation, whether we're talking about seduction, whether, you know, um, and again, this is not to reduce women to those things, but it's to recognize the fact that, and precisely give women back their power, if you like, right, as opposed to saying, no, women don't have any power, and they're just being uh, manipulated or being made vic victims. You know, women are also capable <laughs> of these things. Um, you know, and I think there is a kind of uh, sometimes or at least there's a form of, of rhetorical victimhood that is rewarded by some institutions in the current culture. 
um, okay. which we need to interrogate, I think. Okay. Oh, so many, so many fascinating questions and, and only four minutes to go. This is a little bit heartbreaking. Um, let me just get us on to um, sexuality and um, transgender issues, because I think we should probably get um, some of those um, discussed while we've got time. So Tracy has asked two questions. I'm going to um, lump both of them together. Apologies. Um, so she's wondering First, whether your research focuses primarily on heterosexual men or if it includes homosexual men as well. Yeah. And do you think the two groups have different thoughts on masculinity? And the other question was, did you speak to any trans people about their views of masculin masculinity? And she says she knows trans several trans people have had interesting takes on this, especially as they've been treated as men and women in very different ways, even though they're obviously the same person with the same personality. Yeah, so on the first point, I explicitly said at the beginning of the book, this is a book largely about heterosexual relationships and heterosocial relationships, and I don't go into uh, male uh, homosexuality, um, and I just I just say that basically because it just wouldn't be my place and it wouldn't be fair, um, and you know I couldn't have done the topic justice, and I don't mean to say therefore it's not important or, or not interesting, but I think it just would deserve an entirely other discussion. And in a way, I wanted to say, look, this is my experience. This is based on my, you know, my reality, and I didn't want to talk out of place or on behalf of other groups, even though of course it's a book about men, but it's 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 a feminist book about men, if you see what I mean. Um, and I, I sort of mock myself for like the presumption in any case. Um, mm -hmm. I did on the second point, I actually read a lot of trans uh, men's memoirs. Um, and there was initially a discussion in the book. There was a chapter on uh, trans masculinity, which I thought was very interesting. And I, 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 I felt that I was very, um, I don't know how to put it, um, careful in the way that I, I read these books and, and wrote about them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was a complicated question, not really led by me about um, taking that discussion out. Um, I, I, I won't say too much more on that, <laughs> but it's a controversial topic. Okay. I think publishers, you know, they're very worried about these kind of discussions. But I would say one yeah. of the very, very interesting things that I think this may be raised in the question that I, I noticed in some of the memoirs was actually a very moving um, descriptions of what it was to actually be treated as a man. And it often didn't mm -hmm. involve things that you might imagine. It was things like I was ignored. My feelings were ignored. Mm -hmm. You know, I was mm -hmm. treated as if I wasn't there, you know, which is not how we're supposed to imagine male power you know, or what right. it is to be a man in the world. So there were some fantastic insights in these in these memoirs that I read. And it was it's, it's a shame that they they um, were not more discussed in the book. Hmm. Sounds like there's another book in that one. Um, <laughs> not by me. So um, I think probably um, our last question, I'm going to go to one from Steve. And he says, how can I as a man be the kind of male ally you would like to have? Yeah, well, I think it's it's I think it's not even about being an ally in that sense. I think it's, you know, like I say, men taking responsibility for themselves and for other men and, and you know, like all of us trying to be better and think about what it is to be a good person, you know, and, and to think about what it is to be a good person, but also a good man and a good woman at the same time, you know, and I think I, in the book, I talk about game playing and lightheartedness and a certain kind of humor and, and maybe not being so kind of, you know, heavy handed with each other. Um, which isn't always possible and I know I know that it's difficult and some social situations are really difficult or interpersonal mm. you know relationships are often really hard and and there is abuse there is violence there is difficulty but I think it would be you know trying to confront the world as it is and and to be realistic but also um, to be kind of um, yeah dialogic and forgiving where appropriate you know and and to not um not to think that you know any one of us has the as a group or as an individual has the the final say or the the right answer I suppose and just mm. to be kind of open um yeah <laughs> okay thank you uh, honestly we could go on all night but I'm not allowed I'm I'm very much supposed to keep to time so um I just first of all want to thank you, Nina, for um, a really fascinating discussion of some 
good meaty issues and thank you not just for your talk and for your book but for your willingness to engage with all of the all of the questions that that we've had and there are there are dozens more and i haven't even got to mine um but um yeah thanks thanks for for that it's really fascinating um hour um thank you to our audience too for um all of your um really interesting questions um if you would like to purchase a copy of the book what do men want masculinity and its discontents it's available from our partner books bookseller fox lane books um, and have a look on the festival website or on foxlanebooks.co.uk slash festival of ideas festival hyphen of hyphen ideas for um, any of that um, and please do continue to engage with the york festival of ideas i'm going um to attend um a fascinating one on the history of um disease at eight o'clock so um there's so much going on have a look at the have a look at the um the um website for a list of what's going on every day for the next um few days at least